All right, folks, welcome to another episode from The Expositor. I think this is episode 11. I, I omitted the last episode and removed it off of the channel. So I think this moves this one back down to episode 11, I believe. Uh, folks, my wife and I just got back from a three-day trip from an undisclosed hiding place, a place where there's no internet, a place where there's no cell phone connectivity, which is a wonderful thing. Can't even text on your phone. Isn't that great? Get away from it all. Yeah. And as soon as I, we were pulling into our driveway, I, we left our wireless router on, shouldn't have done that. But as soon as the, the, my cell phone, which does not have data, was connecting to the wi wireless router, uh, I noticed I was getting tons of cell phone notifications. I thought, oh boy, man, was there a death in the family? Is there an emergency? Is, uh, was there an emergency with the nation? I don't know. But I looked at the phone, I could tell that it was uh, my Twitter feed, just smoking. My Twitter feed was hot. I, wow, something's going on Twitter. I follow a lot of people on Twitter, and uh, something's going on on Twitter. And sure enough, so once I, uh, we unloaded and got things uh, settled down and got the four furry friends in the backyard, so we didn't have to take them potty anymore. Uh, that's a nice thing, taking your dogs in the backyard where they can just go potty rather than having to take them potty in a place where wild animals can kill them. Anyways, uh, I went ahead and sat down and, and logged onto the computer and uh, examined my Twitter feed. And unfortunately, a, tra tra a tragic incident occurred uh, with, uh, I'm going to use this phrase loosely, with Bethel Church up in Redding, California. As you know, Folks, uh, I'm going to be careful to not name names on this podcast. Even when it is, involves in apologetics or polemics, I'm actually going to be careful uh, to not name names um, because I don't always have it right, and I don't want to uh, unnecessarily throw discord amongst the brethren if I am wrong or if my motives might be wrong. But this church I will name by name. It's it's a her it's a it's full of heresies. The Bethel Church in Redding, California. Uh, they're heretics and lunatics. Um, uh, you've, some of you are watching their, their music, Bethel music. Um, uh, almost as they're actually, I would put, probably put Bethel music in the same category as Hillsong music. Uh, full of false teachings, bad theology, uh, heresy. Uh, the Bethel church is exactly what Paul warned about in the church of Corinth, that some have uh, another Jesus, a different gospel, and another spirit. It's a, it's not the Jesus of the scriptures according to the scriptures. And we always use the word of God as our test to compare uh, their fruit. And so and evidently, uh, uh, the one of the persons on staff, a well-known professing Christian on their worship team, um, their two-year-old little girl tragically died. A uh, little girl's name is Olive, an unexpected death. Uh, of a two-year-old died. Uh, this happened um, actually before we went on our trip, on our three-day um, excursion getaway. And uh, this girl had already been, the paramedics had have already responded, already declared her dead. Um, and uh, the police have already responded. Uh, the coroner's office, the county coroner's office have already taking, taken uh, the decedent, the cadaver, uh, to the coroner's office for an inquest, for an autopsy. And uh, I don't know if the autopsy has been formed or not, but be careful, folks, about prejudging an incident. We don't know the cause of death yet, and we don't know the manner of death. You might be surprised of why that little girl died. We just don't know, but God does, that's for sure. And the little girl might know, but God knows everything. God is sovereign, folks. He's not sitting up, and, and, and this is what the Twitter feed looked like. Total chaos. People, professing Christians, flipping out and freaking out. Um, not at the heresies. Oh, oh, by the way, this church, uh, the word, quote-unquote, church, the Bethel Church uh, up in Reading, was um, calling their entire congregation and churches universally uh, to pray that God would resurrect this little girl, Olive, from the dead. And she's already been dead. Folks, 
post-lividity and, and rigor mortis have already set in. She's already on a cold slab at the coroner's office. She's already dead. And they're praying that God would do a miracle and raise her from the dead. Many days after, she's already been declared dead. Now, I know a little bit about death. I've seen so much death as a police officer. I have experienced um, several, many near-death incidences where I should have been dead, but clearly when you look at everything afterwards, it's, it was clearly a miracle by God. And the most recent near-death experience that I experienced wasn't a near-death experience. It was a death experience. So I believe in miracles. I believe that God still does miracles. Just three years ago, next month, January 25th of 2017, thankfully, while in a medical facility, getting some tests done, getting things done for my heart that was failing, it was weakening and failing. I was diagnosed with heart disease just a couple months before that date. And on January 25th, just three years ago, my heart stopped and I went not just in, not just a heart attack, not just a cardiac arrest, but full cardiac arrest. And as you know, in one video, I later woke up at the Loma Linda Medical University Medical Center in the, in the critical cardiac unit and in extreme pain from my bones and my chest being crushed. And they told me, Mr. Retz, you had three full cardiac arrests and you were declared dead. The doctor on record declared me dead. My wife was there when all of this happened. But God saw fit that I would be brought back to life. Did he use modern day signs and wonders? No. Did he use apostles? No. God does not work that way. Can God raise a person from the dead that's been dead a week, a week, a week long? Yes, God can do anything. But man cannot. The church cannot. The, there's no power in Bethel church's prayers. The power is in God. The power is in Christ. The power, dunamis, is in the Holy Spirit. The power is in the Scripture, the infallible, inerrant, sufficient Word of God. That's where the power is, not in anything that I say or do. But God saw it by His divine will that I would die and be declared dead on the table. Medical records declared dead. The date of death, here's the date and here's the time when it was called. And three different times, God saw it fit that he would enable a medical doctor to shock paddle my chest with paddles. A respiratory therapist who was called into the room when I went code blue to do the respiratory portion with the mouth and the air and then a man that they said they had to find a man that was large, close to 300 pounds, and I later got to meet him. He's the one they used for CPR because the first doctor was not effective on my chest because he wasn't big enough to compress my chest. I'm 6'2", 250 pounds. They needed a large man to be able to compress my chest. And by the grace of God, I stand here to tell you about that story, which happened only three years ago. So I'm, I'm an example that God can still raise people from the dead. No, rigor mortis had not set in. No, post lividity did not already uh, gravitate itself through my body. No, I was not in the mortuary like this little three, uh, two-year-old girl is. But folks, I want to talk a little bit about the doc. First of all, this is important. I am not an authority. I am not your shepherd, and I am not your hireling. Matter of fact, I no longer receive donations. You'll never hear me again ask for money, though I rarely did, maybe once a year. Because I don't want to be tainted. I don't, want, I don't want to think that I have to please a vast, anonymous, or known audience that financially supports what I do. I'm just a guy. I'm just a knucklehead with a camera. I'm just another knucklehead with, with, a, with a microphone that does podcasts. Just, just an ordinary sinner saved by an extraordinary Savior. I don't care if the, stu if, the, if, the, if the podcasts or YouTube channels that you subscribe to and watch have, have a huge $200,000 studio 
with fancy cameras that move around from different angles on, on dollies and cranes and on all of this fancy bells and whistles. Folks, none of them are an authority. None of us are an authority. Only Christ is the authority of the church. And through his scriptures, only through God, through Christ and his scriptures, should we seek advice uh, as far as a final authority is concerned. And let me tell you something, folks. Have you ever heard of the saying, terrible twos? Well, I'm seeing on social media, even reformed, alleged reformed Christians that at least believe in a reformed soteriology are declaring this two-year-old girl in heaven with acronyms like R.I.P., rest in peace. And somebody asked me, Bill, do you believe that, and this is where I'm going to respond to a question with an answer, and that's henceforth the reason for this podcast. Somebody asked me, Bill, do you believe that she's resting in peace? And my dear friends, know this. The biblically correct answer, the the only theologically correct answer that I can give you is I don't know. None of us know. None of us know if this two-year-old girl went to heaven. It would be wrong for us to say she did, and it would be wrong for us to say she did not. It would be wrong to say she's in heaven with the Lord, It would be wrong to say she went to hell where she'll be under the wrath of a holy, just God. We just do not know. You cannot know with a two-year-old. And unfortunately, many people in the pro-life ministry apparently, seemingly, are worshiping the pre-born, and they're giving up sound doctrine in the name of protecting the pre-born, and they're giving up sound doctrine to protect those that have been born. And the scriptures are our authority, so I'm going to, matter of fact, I have to say this. There was a time that I believed in the false doctrine of the age of accountability. There was a time that I believed that you had to be a certain age to be accountable for your sins. In other words, if you died as a fetus in a mother's womb, I wrongfully thought that they all went to heaven. If you died outside of the womb as a young child or an adolescent or a toddler, I wrongfully was taught and thought that they would go to heaven. Henceforth, the false doctrine of the age of accountability. I no longer believe that. I no longer believe that. And some of our alleged reformed brethren on YouTube are not tackling this issue. They're actually watering down the gospel to tickle each itchy ears by saying this girl is quote-unquote R.I.P., resting in peace. We do not know if she's resting in peace. If she was God's elect, she will be resting in peace forever, no matter how she died or why she died. Excuse me. Oh, thank God for mute mute buttons there. Got the sneezes. Is this girl R.I.P.? You know, when I see this R.I.P. misused on the internet, it reminds me of gangsters. In Los Angeles, when a gangster was slain, their gangs, their gang members would write R.I.P., you know, T-Bone, R.I.P., Malo, uh, rest in peace, homeboy. Man, and Christians are using that jargon on the internet, professing Christians, professing Reformed Christians that have at least a Reformed soteriology. We don't know if she's R.I.P. This little girl had heart problems just like me. Who knows, maybe we'll find out she died of heart problems. But she had spiritual heart problems just like Bill Retz. The Bible says we've all been born into sin. We're going to talk about that. But Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Some translations say our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds or her deeds. Our hearts are wicked and 
de desperately deceitful. Who can understand man's heart? That, that's how bad our hearts are. That's why they must be circumcised by the Holy Spirit. That's why our hearts must be regenerate before we give our last breath so that we can go to heaven and RIP rather than go to hell where Bill Retz deserves. It says in Romans chapter 3, where is it right here? Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. None does good, the scripture says. And then it says in verse 13, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. And then in verse 23 of Romans 3, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Even a two-year-old has sinned. And it's not popular or politically correct to say that, but that is the truth, my friends. This is a no-spin zone. This is where you're not going to get your ears tickled. And this is a video that will get me many unsubscribers, no doubt. A matter of fact, I'm going to turn comments off so that nobody can comment and input their false teachings and man-centered soteriologies underneath this video. Well, here's another verse. Look at this. 1 John chapter 1. This little girl has sinned. We've all sinned, folks. We've all sinned. And it says, let me read Romans 5 first. Romans 5, the doctrine of original sin, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, this is Adam, the first Adam, the, remember the sin, the fall of man in the, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the, the sin. Therefore, just through one man's sin, that's Adam in the garden, through one man's sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. All have sinned. Because of the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says, I have sinned. I am already condemned, it says, according to John chapter 3. Already condemned. I don't need to condemn you. You don't need to condemn me. The Bible says we were already born into sin and already under condemnation until we become born again. See, that's why we must be born twice. That's why we must be born the second time by the last and final Adam, whom is Jesus the Christ. That's why we must enter this, uh, so to speak, a theological womb and come out as a new creation in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. That's why the John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5 says we must be born again. Jesus said, I tell you, surely, I, why, why, do we, why do we must be born again? Because Jesus said, I, surely I say to you, you must be born again of both the water and the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural uh, picture, a theological womb, if you will, of going into a, a spiritual womb and coming out as a new creature in Christ. Where that wicked, desperate hearts that we just talked about in Jeremiah 17.9 17, now becomes regenerate by the Holy Spirit regenerate by the Holy Spirit. We have a, a nine-year-old granddaughter that faithfully goes to our church. Every Sunday morning, she sits under the teaching, the adult teachings of our pastor's sermons. Teaching. I mean, not in a youth ministry, because you won't find youth ministry in the Bible. She sits under the teachings where all the other children sit under the teachings of the pastor. She's been hearing the Word of God now. And she's in a Sunday school for kids during the adult Sunday school, where she's been presented both the law and the gospel. And I, a nine-year-old, I can't even say for sure that I know that she is regenerate. I know that she has an intellectual belief, but there's no evidence of a true salvific response of repentance and faith in Christ as her Savior. So how is it that anonymous people can go on, or people can go on the internet alleged Reformed brethren regarding an anonymous two-year-old girl from a church that preaches and teaches gross heresies, 
a fanatical church that teaches heresies, and you all claim that she's R.I.P., resting in peace, a two-year-old. Have you ever heard of the saying, terrible twos? Did we ever have to teach a two-year-old to cry or, or, or to lie? Did we ever have to teach a, a terrible twos, a two-year-old to be selfish or stingy? Or to say it's mine? Or to be rebellious against their mother and father? My friends, we've all sinned against the sovereignty of God. We've all sinned against our parents. We're guilty. We're under condemnation and the power of sin. We're, we're slaves to our sin until we become saved, and then we become a bond slave to Christ. About 10 years ago, I, I, I talked to you about my personal experience three years ago. Clinically dead. Does God still save people physically from the dead? Yes, he can, and yes, he will. Although I'm not aware of a case like Lazarus where they already stinketh. But could God do that today? Absolutely. God can do anything, but man cannot. The Bethel so-called church cannot do anything that they, how, uh, according to how they twist God's word. But 10 years ago, approximately, one of our grandchildren died at a very extremely young age. And, and I, I wrongfully, I, I actually shared half the message at that funeral. And back then, I truly believed in the doctrine of the age of accountability. And I confess this to my church that we attend now, that I wrongfully taught false teaching. I wrongfully taught heresy by declaring our granddaughter to be RIP, although I didn't use that lingo, but to be in heaven with the Lord. And folks, I've had to repent from that false teaching. I've had to repent and confess to people and family members that I was wrong. I don't know. There's no way in the world I can know if that little girl, our granddaughter, is in heaven or if she's in hell for an eternity. And there's no way that we can know this little girl in, in Northern California in Redding by the name of Olive. There's no way we can know if this two-year-old girl is with the Lord, where there is no pain and sorrow, where she's, if she's with the Lord forever, or if she is in hell under the wrath of a holy, just God because of her sins. You know why we don't know? Because we cannot know if she was God's elect. The doctrine of election is very important. You know, it says in Ephesians, before I was saved, before Bill Retz, this sinner, was born again, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. That word dead is the Greek word necros. And it means, metaphorically speaking and spiritually speaking, that I was as dead as a corpse in a graveyard. I was as dead as this little girl's body is right now in a coroner's office in, Redding, in the county of Reading or Whiskey Town, wherever she's at. I was that dead, unable to respond to the things of God. I was dead in a cross, unable to, to accept Jesus into my heart, unable to raise my hand in an unbiblical altar call in a little kid's Sunday school, dead in my trespasses in the cross, unable to make a decision for Christ, unable to repeat a, 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 a heretical, man-centered sinner's prayer, and then let my pastor... Tell me you are now born again because you repeated my prayer. The Bible says we were dead in the cross, in our, dead in our trespasses and sins, and unable to do these things. And even if we were able to do those things, they are unbiblical. They are anti-biblical. You know, I'm thankful. I wish I had done this earlier in my Christian life, but belonging to a full confessional church, we subscribe to uh, the 1689 uh, adopted, written, published in the, in the year 1689, the London Baptist Confession of Faith. You can go to my website and click on the little link that says Statement of Faith, and you'll see that my Statement of Faith is the 1689 Confession of Faith. It's basically, uh, I know this doesn't sound very scholarly, but it's, but it's a Statement of Faith on steroids. It's a, it's a doctrinal statement on steroids, if you will, and it explains all of the doctrines that we adhere to. And I have a full subscription to our Confession of Faith. But in chapter 10, speaking of, of uh, salvific issues, speaking more specifically of the doctrine of the effectual calling, uh, 
it says in, in chapter 10, verse 23, regarding infants, and of course this would also apply to two-year-olds. This would also apply to the preborn, uh, to the child who dies in the womb. This would apply to everybody, actually. Uh, and that, that, that it could, it, this could also apply to a person that's maybe 20 years old, that's severely retarded and severely so disabled that we would never know if they are, uh, uh, if they profess um, a, a, a true salvific faith and belief and trust in, in, in Christ to salvation. But in par- paragraph chapter three, or excuse me, paragraph three of chapter 10, it says, Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who works when and where and how he pleases. So also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the Word. So is this little girl R.I.P., resting in peace? Is she in heaven? Is this little girl Olive in hell? The answer is we don't know. Because we cannot know if she was God's elect. Salvation is the monergistic work of the Godhead, my friends. It's not our emotions. Chapter 1 of, uh, excuse me, paragraph 1 says this. Those whom God hath predestined unto life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time, effectually to call, by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so that they come most freely being made willing, willing by his grace." We don't know if this occurred in Olive's life. I do not know if this occurred in our grandchild's life. We just don't know. Therefore, the most biblically, theologically correct answer we can give is, I don't know, lest we become a liar and a false teacher. Matter of fact, speaking of liars, let me, let me well, I'm going to try to remember to go to 1 John. Well, I'm going to say it right now. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 says that if we say we have no sin, the truth is in not in us. If we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us, and we make God a liar. Are you going to make God a liar and say that this little girl had no sin? Are you going to make God a liar and say that this girl was sinless and perfect, that she was just, righteous, and holy, which she was not? There is no one righteous. No, not even one, it says in Romans 3. Don't call God a liar and say that this girl was not a sinner. And to say that she didn't need to be saved from her sins. She did, according to the word of God. Paragraph 2 of chapter 10 of the Confession of Faith. This effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, nor from any power or agency in the creature co-working with his special grace, the creature being wholly passive therein, being dead in sins and trespasses, dead in the cross, in sins and trespasses, until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Here is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it, and that by no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. Folks, I'm going to put chapter 10 of this confession of faith in the description field and that way you can study study hard and read all of the cross-reference verses because this confession of faith is not the word of god but it's a summarization of what the word of god says it's basically a commentary on what the word of god says it's a summarization of the doctrine seen in the scriptures so you can study the verses that that this confession of faith is speaking highly of it has a high view of the scriptures and a low view of man Well, uh, there's only four paragraphs in chapter 10 of the Confession of Faith on the effectual calling, but I would really, truly encourage you uh, to study that. Go to my website again, click on the Statement of Faith, the the, the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith is right there. And uh, folks, I'm I'm speaking now to those of you that, uh, let let me look at something here quick before I continue going.
if you if you claim to be reformed, I would, and I, I I once belonged to a church that was reforming, um, and I asked the pastor if he would adopt him and his elders would adopt our conf- this confession of faith that I now subscribe to, and uh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, and tr- a, a true reformed church will be truly confessional. To be a truly reformed church, you will subscribe to a confession of faith. And again, ours is the London Baptist Confession of Faith. When you subscribe to the confession of faith and you believe in the confession according to the scriptures because it agrees with the word of God, it's basically the Bible in a nutshell. Again, it's it's like a doctrinal statement on steroids that tells you what the word of God says about doctrine. So with all of these distractions that I'm having here, with my microphone swinging around on its stupid arm, uh, Christians, I would reform Christians. I would encourage you to encourage your pastor and elders to uh, fully subscribe to a confession of faith. Again, uh, the London Baptist Confession of Faith is is a Reformed Baptist is what I subscribe to. Um, because if you don't, your doctrines are going to be all over the place. If you don't, your doctrine is going to be it's going to be skewed. It's going to be all over the place, just like I'm seeing on these Reformed uh, channels, all over the place, declaring unknown two-year-olds RIP in heaven. And we shouldn't be doing that, folks. That is false teaching. Unless you're omniscient, unless you have the omniscience of God, in other words, unless you are all-knowing, you have that uh, that power of, of, an, of being omniscient that only God has, unless you're omniscient, you do not know where the state of that little girl's soul is. So, folks, uh, we're not going to we're not going to teach tickle each itchy ears here. I'm not here. I'm not your hireling, and I'm not your shepherd, and I'm not your authority. Again, none of us are your authority. Christ is the authority, and the Scriptures are our final authority. And for those of you that uh, aren't sure about your salvation, uh, eternal life, and death, would you go to the little link on my to- on the menu bar of the website, click on the link that says the glorious gospel, click on that link, read it. it, it it's saturated with the word of God, and, uh, and respond to that gospel call simply in repentance and faith. And if the monergistic work of the Godhead, if God chooses to save you as one of his elect, he will, and then his Holy Spirit will do a work of sanctification, and then you will be radically saved and eventually radically changed by a radical God. Until we meet again, have a great day. 